Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, excuse me, everyone. Thank you for joining us on a Monday, a uh, very busy Monday. Um, so we're just going to crack on and have a discussion uh, with um, Dipan Ghosh, who is the author of Terms of Disservice, How Silicon Valley is Destructed by Design, and also uh, part of the Digital Platforms and Democracy Project at the Harvard Kennedy School. Nancy Gibbs, uh, Faculty Director of the Schoenstein a Center on Media Politics and Public Policy, and Robbie Mook, formerly the campaign manager with the Clinton campaign in 2016, and now I think senior fellow, right, at the Belfast Center. Uh, sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for everyone for joining us. A couple of points of order before we get going. Uh, we are recording, so say hello to, <laughs> to your future selves. Uh, and also there is a chat box down there. Um, if you have any questions for anyone about what we're going to discuss, throw them in there and we'll get them when we can. I should introduce myself. I'm Mark Scott. I'm Politico's chief tech correspondent. And that's my bike. Forgive me. I'm at home like everyone else right now. So, uh, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Dupin, I'm going to start with you. Uh, the book, um, Terms of Disservice, drops tomorrow. I, frankly, I, I finished it over the weekend, sort of a mad dash before this, this chat. I was struck by a couple things before we open up the, the conversation to Nancy and, and Robbie. First of all, you talk a lot about the problem of Silicon Valley right now is the business model, the commercial interests that are lying at the center of this and how it plays out in a variety of topics we're going to discuss this hour. Can you walk us through specifically what is that nexus right in the center which revolves around the business model which you think is the problem? Yeah, well, well, thank you, Mark. And I uh, just, just want to say very briefly, uh, I really appreciate everyone being here. It's, it's a strange time to launch a book, uh, but, um, but I, I really appreciate everyone's flexibility. Um, really, the, the crux of this book is, uh, and, and my perspective is drawn from, uh, from some experience in industry and in government. And what I try to contend, uh, as, as Mark was, uh, Mark, you're alluding to is that uh, when we look at uh, when we look at the media ecosystem today, we see we we see these platforms like Facebook and Google dominating the media ecosystem entirely. Uh, when we when we think about the internet, uh, when we use the internet to to consume news media or 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 other forms of media, it's it's to those platforms that we go to. And uh, one of the one of the central points that I try to make in the book is that. Whether we look at Facebook or Google or Amazon or, or any of these other kind of consumer internet uh, platforms, uh, the, the business model, the, the core practices that kind of govern the way that they operate uh, is consistent. Um, and it's, it's really driven by uh, the collection on an uninhibited basis of a lot of information, uh, including personal data. Uh, the development of algorithms uh, to, to develop behavioral profiles on people and, uh, and curate content in our, in our feeds uh, and uh, keeping rivals at bay uh, through, through various means, including both fair and unfair means uh, as, as uh, our legal system kind of uh, sees, uh, sees market strategies. Um, and it's those core business practices that, uh, that really define this business model. Uh, and if we really want to try to renegotiate the terms of, uh, of, of our economic debate uh, in the United States and around the world, we need to really understand that business model and relate that business model at its, at its core to everything that's happening today, whether it's the protests or whether it's uh, politics and our, our national elections or, uh, or, or this, this pandemic. Uh, part of the book, not to give away the ending, talks about a new social contract that is required because of the role that these companies are playing now in our, in our lives. It revolves around potentially new privacy rules, limiting potentially how, what they, companies they buy in the future, and also providing greater transparency, I believe, to, to how the whole business works. What would that look like? Uh, people are now looking for answers. There's, we kind of know what the problem is, but what happens next? Well, what is the, the contract you're looking to lay out? Yeah, yeah. So uh, what, what, I, what I try to share in this book is that if, if this business model is, is in part responsible for all the harms that we're seeing at the forefront of society today, you know, the disinformation problem, the spread of hate speech, um, the spread of, uh, of discrimination, if, 
if it's the business model that's in part responsible for that because of how it's engineered to engage us, keep us scrolling, and potentially um, uh, push us toward very engaging content that, that may or may not be offensive, and in many cases is offensive, um, if, if that's the problem, then, and, and if you were to agree that the, the description of this consistent business model underlying the internet uh, follows this form and function that, I, that, that we just talked about, then um, if, we, if we analyze that even further, it's really the company in this, in this kind of this interaction between the, the individual consumer and a company like Facebook, it's really the company Facebook that has unilateral power to collect as much data as it wants, use it in whatever way it wants, to, to take different kinds of strategies in the marketplace uh, in, in terms of corporate development or uh, mergers and acquisitions in whatever way it wants. And if we, if we really wanna renegotiate the, the uh, distribution of economic power as it has to relate to, to the media sector today, then uh, we, need to, we, need to, we need to rebalance that by giving some of that power back to consumers. So in the, in the area of, of uninhibited data collection, consumers need privacy rights. Um, in the area of, uh, of essentially the development of opaque algorithms that can, that can cause bias and, uh, and cause engagement at historic levels that, that it could, could push us toward offensive content necessarily, um, perhaps we need better transparency uh, so, that, so that journalists and researchers and the broader public can understand how these algorithms work and start to suggest new ways of, of developing them. And if, if these companies are uh, kind of doing whatever they want in the, in the, uh, in the marketplace, uh, holding rivals at bay, acquiring whom they wish without regulatory scrutiny, um, then, then perhaps we need to think about uh, competition policy reform. Nancy, I, I was reading your uh, Q&A with uh, Sundar Pichai from Google before we got on the call, and I was struck by how there's a sort of a love-hate issue here in terms of both Google and other tech companies' role within uh, frankly, the, the COVID crisis and subsequently sort of we are using them more than ever but the role that they are playing is also becoming more pronounced. I mean, what did you take away from that, that conversation with him in terms of where both Google and, other, and others see themselves within the ecosystem? And, and where do you think some of the limits should be? I, I think the pandemic, as it accelerated so many things, so many trends, like, you know, a lot of people were working from home now, many more people are working from home, uh, a million different things that just um, went so much faster. The reckoning with the public responsibility of the platforms just, which obviously has been central to a lot of our conversations, a lot of media coverage, some you know, regulatory debate, um, accelerated so much when it became so literally a matter of life and death, when you started having people showing up in emergency rooms after drinking bleach, right? And that the, the speed with which conspiracy theories spread, misinformation spread, quack cures uh, and profiteering spread at a time of, of this global crisis. I think for all of the, the technology leaders, this made this a much less ab abstract academic, we can negotiate our way through this, we're gonna play a certain amount of cat and mouse with regulators. The, the, the dynamics of the discussion that we had been having I think changed dramatically with the with the pandemic, and you know, to to their credit, I think we saw um, saw Google, saw Twitter, saw platforms recognizing that they needed to set a much higher standard for the kind of content that was going to be promoted, having to do with the pandemic. That they needed to try to um, privilege authoritative sources rather than uh, the most emotional, the most manipulative. Uh, information, but we are so early, I think, in the reckoning with the role that our information system played in where we find ourselves now. And if, if, if we saw nothing else, we saw how much better the people are who want to spread bad information 
uh, than the ones who want to get good information out. The, you know, the CDC and the WHO are pretty overmatched by uh, people who have either a magical cure to sell or a desire to get a conspiracy theory to go viral. That asymmetrical warfare, I think, had such a, we've had, we're having such a reckoning with it because every one of us has so much at stake. And so with, with Sundar, I really felt the, the sense of responsibility I think he feels because, you know, not just Google, obviously YouTube have an enormous role to play in preventing the, the worst, the misinformation from taking hold the way we are, we are seeing that happen. I think we may have lost Mark. Yeah, Mark might have frozen. <laughs> Froze. <laughs> nothing I said. Uh. Um, so I think uh, I think um, maybe the next. Um, uh, trying to think, Nancy. What do you What do you suggest? Because you're the you're the uh, one with greatest journalistic expertise here. How do we... Uh, Alex, uh, if, if our moderators can privately text Mark and have him log out and log I'm, in. Am I back? Can you hear me? Oh, he's back. Yes. <laughs> the, the joys of the internet. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm not sure why I got cut off, Robbie. I, I, I was just turning to you in terms of the current crisis, COVID crisis. I mean, Nancy meant, is talking about how they are taking greater responsibility, but for you, how have they done? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I, at the end of the day, and uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm so excited that Dipian uh, put out this this book because I, I think um, he's really crystallized a really important, you know, angle of or, or vector of this discussion because I think there there's a lot of uh, just kind of latent hostility uh, sometimes towards social media. I think he's done such a good job of really distilling down some of the engine here. And I think... To, to the point, uh, to many of the points he makes in his book, um, there, there's a point where the government just has to step in and, and regulate, you know? Um, one of the, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna make a, a, an imperfect uh, historical analogy here, but I think, I think there, there are some parallels, which is, you know, as soon as uh, broadcast communications came about, television and radio, uh, the government stepped in pretty quickly uh, to regulate, to create transparency around ownership, to regulate, you know, how those mediums are used to ensure that the public, first of all, that there was just some public good coming out of them, right? It's not, it's not a mistake that a broadcast television station has to have the evening news, right? And, there, and, it, and it has to be, um, you know, there has to be equal time for, for candidates and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but uh, you know we can never expect these these corporations that uh, you know have a fiduciary responsibility to to step up and do a lot of this on their own because it will impact uh, their bottom line. So, look, I, I I agree with Nancy, and I'm not here to be just sort of uh, blindly hostile to these companies. But I I think you know to to what's been mentioned earlier, there's a transparency problem. There's a lack of regulation. We have not provided those guidelines. So Mark Zuckerberg's out there able to say, well, I'm the protector of free speech, right? Um, so that's why I'm not doing this. Another, you know, another platform can say, well, we don't think we really have this responsibility, so we're going in this direction. And then lastly, I, there's not liability. I mean, this is the biggest problem in my mind is that someone can put something out that is incorrect, misleading, malicious. The, the platform can make money off of that. Uh, and pay no costs to society for, for doing that. Um, uh, you know, it's, I, I, again, this is not a perfect analogy, but, you know, a lot of polluters will argue, well, sure, I create pollution, but look at these great products I create and everybody likes them. Well, they also have a responsibility to clean up the harm they're causing. And I, I, think, I think that's just where the, you know, we, frankly, as voters need to demand that that regulation takes place because it's not good enough. But Again, in a way, I don't blame the companies. I think that's on society to step in and, and use the power we have to do something. 
I say, Robin, you sound like Mark Zuckerberg, right? Isn't uh, he does make the point about regulation? Regulators need to step in and create rules, right? So, well, except the, only the rules he wants them to create. I mean, that's <laughs> no, but but that's where I guess I'd agree with him. I mean, I I think a lot of I think his free speech stuff is just absurd. You know, he, you know, you can't walk into a store and have a and have a KKK rally. You know, Walmart can kick you out. You know, they're just like Facebook claiming that they're somehow protecting our our you know our our, our God given rights is is absurd. And so that's why I, I think part of the reason he says that is because he knows he knows he can grind that regulation uh, down pretty fast. Define as someone who did work for the executive branch. Why do you think we haven't been able to get the internet rules that? Robbie and others have, have asked for? Uh, well, you know, I think that, um, first of all, I, I should say that uh, there are, there are, I think, many, many participants on this, this call who could, who could answer this better than I can, um, in, including David. I, I see you there and, and, uh, and several others. Um, you know, I think, uh, I, I think it's it's such a such a difficult um, uh, difficult concept tech regulation because I, first of all you know it's it's such a broad industry um, it's hard I think for for average Americans to even understand not understand but rather get their head around um, the the fact that well uh, we we have the internet we have internet service. Um, they relate to each other, but they're essentially two different industries. Within the internet, um, there's a lot of different subsectors, and um, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think first of all, it's it's very hard to even start to describe the business model that that kind of runs the the consumer internet um, in a way that we can not uh, kind of specifically target one company but develop a, a higher order regulation that can, um, that can kind of apply to the sector across the board and, and um, assess, uh, assess the economic merits of the industry and, um, and, and really uh, try to respond to, to the ways that it interacts with society in negative ways, negative and positive ways. Um, so, so there's that, which is that this is a complex industry it's hard for policymakers who are, who are focused on many different things at any given time uh, to, to really follow uh, to the T. Um, then I think um, there's a there's a big problem uh, with uh, with lobbying. Uh, let's let's not not leave that aside. Um, you know I think that the industry has has its arguments and 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 yet some of those arguments may not be in the usually are not in the best interest of the public. Um, I'll leave that uh, comment there though, but, um, but that's, that's something that we, we can't ignore. Um, but I think going to the heart of this is, is really, um, in, in one part of the book, what I describe is this, this matter of a privacy paradox, where um, you know, we've seen so many events like the Cambridge Analytica revelations and the Snowden disclosures and, and so many others. And yet, we don't, uh, we don't have, um, uh, th these, have, these have each caused tremendous reaction in the public. Um, and yet we don't, have a, we don't have a privacy law in the United States. Why not? Um, I think it's, a, I think it's a really a, few, a combination of a few factors. First, um, we, often, uh, we often look at the privacy problem and, um, and, and try to sign up for services immediately without thinking about how they might affect us negatively in the, in the long run. Um, but I think the, the bigger harm here uh, that we're doing, uh, that the bigger disservice we're doing to ourselves is that privacy is, uh, from an individual perspective, maybe not so big a deal that you know, we're handing our information off to Facebook and Facebook is, uh, is and Google are, are potentially using it in various ways, but um, it, it doesn't really have a, a harmful impact on us immediately or ever. Uh, it has a bigger harmful impact on society in the long run, in the sense that once these companies have this surveillance machine, they can, um, they can essentially coordinate um, a, a, a huge uh, kind of 
media ecosystem uh, and, and control it. And uh, good actors and especially bad actors can start to try to find ways to game that system. And I think that's the, that's the real harm that we, that we don't necessarily see when we're interacting with Facebook on a day-to-day -day basis as, as everyday consumers. So I, I'm conscious that we were 20 uh, minutes into this call and we haven't mentioned Trump, Twitter, or well, we mentioned Facebook. So that's one out of three. Um, I'm struck by the recent uh, issues in terms of how the platforms have dealt with some of uh, the president's comments uh, and how they've diverged. And that's led to uh, questions around what should be done. Um, Nancy, if this was a, a newspaper, there would be rules in place. Yes, First Amendment, but there are things you can and can't say. How much are the platforms now media companies, non-neutral platforms? I, I would argue they've always been media companies pretending not to be because it's in their interest. And, and you know, this may be where, you know, Depay and I'd be curious about about your framing because your focus is so much on the on economic regulation uh, and you and you talk about the content policy the focus on content policy being misplaced so I of course speaking as an editor where content policy is you know my life's blood but it it feels to me that what we're seeing particularly now and in the argument over over the president's tweets and and uh, the limits of acceptable discourse is that even though we may disagree about where to put up guardrails, I don't think we disagree that there need to be guardrails. Just as you know, we've always had rules about you know the equivalent of crying fire in a crowded theater, and so the the actual harm that is caused to people who are um, the victims of, of enormous amounts of online abuse uh, and the damage that is done to public discourse and to individuals, both the social damage and the individual damage, uh, to me points to the fact that content has to be a piece of this, that it's, um, it, it can't be one or the other, that yes, the economic underpinnings are and the business model is critical, you know, for media, the other piece of it is obviously the crisis in the business model of journalism has a lot to do with the uh, the predatory nature of the platform. So it feels to me like we can't break these apart and say only one of these is going to be the solution. That all of these 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 are, as Divine says, such big, complex companies that the solutions, the problems we're talking about, are going to have to come at it from multiple angles. Yeah. I mean, I'm, so obviously, being the European on the call, I, I got to say that the the European Union have been trying to do this for quite a while, both on privacy content, hate speech, competition, and even with the GDPR, the new privacy rules in place, which I think to prime the name checks in the book, it still doesn't work that well. So even when you have m multiple strands in place when it comes to uh, restricting some of the um, practices of these companies, it's still a uh, a moving target that I don't think anyone right now, maybe other than China for different reasons, has, has gone right. Um, Robbie, asking you just as someone who's worked, you know, in this area, we have obviously a major election coming up. The money's being spent on the platforms is still increasing quite a lot. Micro targeting is in place. The use of people's data by both sides is, is ex expanding. How much would you think this election in 2020 even differs from 2018, let alone 2016, in terms of the sophistication of what can be done in a, frankly, a very digital online election this, 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 where, this time around? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I, and I, um, I mean, look, I think as a general principle, uh, one of the pieces of advice I got before I ran Hillary's campaign in 2016, and I probably got this piece of advice in 2015, was that technology was going to change more, uh, you know, in the in the eight years uh, since Obama had become, or, or was going to change more uh, in the two years before uh, the 2016 election than it had in the previous eight uh, that Obama had been president. I think I think that kind of acceleration is 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 real. I think that I think that was good advice, and so part of this is. Um, keeping up, and I also think that, and, and this, this gets to the issue of regulation, the longer you wait to do something, the more difficult it's going to be to do something because the economic interest, 
the commercial habits are more entrenched. And so I would actually argue we, you know, the country owes it to industry uh, to, to, to get going on this. And I also think, and this really, this really speaks to what Dipayan said is, I worry about two things in politics moving forward. I think the first is, as more data is accumulated, people are going to get better at manipulating communication to voters. And so the, the political debate starts to drift from a contest of ideas to a contest of kind of dirty tricks or manipulation, right? And we're already seeing this. There's almost kind of open talk. Uh, I, won't, I won't name parties here, but you know, of people saying, well, we can basically manipulate this audience really easily into hating this candidate. So that's part of our strategy. And when you really step back and think, I mean, it, it almost seems quaint now. I remember when Al Gore and George W. Bush were debating the lockbox for Social Security. It was like, well, isn't that, isn't that quaint that, that, that we used to have a policy debate? Now it's, it's this sort of cult manipulation of the of reality what's you know well is it are, are we seeing antifa riots or peaceful protests because of a legitimate uh you know grievance that sort of thing and i i just i don't think that's you know healthy and i think the second thing that we need to worry about specific to campaigns in the long term is our communication is becoming increasingly individualized so you know i sign into netflix i sign into an account to see something it used to be back in the day, most of our communications were broadcast. So in a media market, I'm running an advertisement and everybody's seeing it. It's, it's totally imaginable in the future that for example, if a, 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 a woman logs into her computer in house A, I could run her an ad that I'm pro-choice. And if another woman in house B logs in, I could run implying that I'm pro-life. And there's like, there's, there's no accountability for that. And that's what worries me is that campaigning will increasingly become the art of basically trickery. Uh, and I think we, we've, we've, we've almost fetishized campaigning in the digital space so much that we've lost the ability to step back and say, this is just stupid and unproductive. This isn't even what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> and so that, that concerns me. And in some ways, the digital platforms encourage that. I mean, they, Facebook used to push us in 26 to buy these dark ads where basically you didn't know who it was coming from. That was a product and they encouraged us to buy it. Uh, that's no longer the case, but I think there could be other versions of that in the future. Not to put on my sort of corporate lobbyist hat here for a second though, but it feels that it, that is obviously is happening. The data collection is happening. The sophistication of the algorithms is, is helping campaigns target individuals like never before, but it, it also allows people to organize protests against the racial discrimination in recent weeks. It, it allows people to, you know, in Hong Kong, share, you know, messages coming out to, to push back against the Chinese. As much as I have, I also worry about that. Should we not, if we go too far on the regulatory route, lose some of those efforts. The idea of ending end-to-end -end encryption, for example, would be a severe issue for protesters and, and activists around the world. So where is that balance between required regulation around some of the use of the platforms, but it's still allowing them to play a quite fundamental role, particularly outside of the US? Well, I would just jump in quickly. Others know a lot more about this than me, but I, I would say two things. Number one, I think you are seeing the platforms compromised in repressive regimes. So I think that's just happening, period. Uh, and it's driven by economics. And B, I think this, this again gets to regulation. It's, it's about trying to lift up as much of the good as we can and mitigate the bad. And obviously there's a balance there and a give and take. But again, what bothers me is that um, companies that, that, that there is a lack of accountability and a lack of transparency so that companies can enable nefarious actors to do bad things. And there's no way for citizens to see that. There's no way for me to know what you see on Facebook. So I'm not empowered to respond to the incorrect information you've been told that. And everyone will say, well, that would be impossible. But I don't think it's impossible. We got to figure out how to make it possible. That's one. Um, and, uh, you know, and the, and the second point is, you know, I'll use an example myself. Actually, there's an article in the New York Times today. Uh, someone came up with a, 
a, a lie that I was that I somehow built the mobile app that ran the Iowa caucuses. It went wild online, and there's nothing I can do about that. There's there's literally nothing as a private citizen. There's nothing I can do to hold the platform accountable for actively through its algorithm spreading information that's false. And I so that to me is a starting point right there of let's mitigate that. But look, if somebody's organizing a protest, more power to them. That doesn't you know we don't we don't need to stop that. And so I think it's a it's and I know it's easy for me to say as a non technical person. But I think it's important to start at those big, you know, with those big broad brushstrokes and sort of back it out from there. Stefan, does that make sense? Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, completely uh, with Robbie. I, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I think we, we would all agree that we have a, uh, we have a very noisy media environment. One that um, one that features a lot of offending content, uh, content that that we wouldn't want to see, uh, that we wouldn't necessarily want to see ourselves, and we wouldn't necessarily want our our kids to see. Um, and uh, where does that leave us? I mean, we're in a situation now where, because of this kind of machine underlying a, comp a company like Twitter or Facebook or Google, because of this machine. Uh, it's driven to understand us and, uh, and, and, and channel information, content at us uh, in, a, in a way that, um, that just maximally engages us to the end of, of uh, maximizing profit. Um, and if, if we want to really try to uh, counteract that, uh, counteract the, the, the offending content kind of hitting the top of our news feeds, whether it's disinformation or hate speech or, or discrimination or violence or uh, extremist content or whatever it might be, which all of which seems to be having such an impact uh, in our uh, things like our national elections. Um, then, you know, I think what we what we really need to do is understand how that machine works more effectively and start to make adjustments in it. Uh, in a in a way that that can that can bring us back to a uh, an era, uh, in a sense, where we we can we can kind of moderate we can self moderate our the, the the society can self moderate itself through accountability, uh, and 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 through other forms of uh, of uh, essentially. Um, People, people being able to stand up for what they're saying. Um, so uh, I also take Nancy's comment really well. I, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right, Nancy, that we need to, we, while, I, while I say that we need to think about economic reform in, in the form of competition policy, in the form of uh, data regulation, transparency, uh, we do need to think about content policy uh, because it is it is an issue of, of today. We've seen this with uh, with Trump and, and Twitter and and both uh, the Biden campaign, both Pre uh, Vice President Biden and Donald Trump have suggested that we need to reform uh, Section 230. First through Trump's, um, well, first through uh, Vice President Biden's statements uh, that we need to potentially rescind uh, and reform Section 230 and and. Also, a couple of weeks ago, through through Trump's uh, executive order, um, and you know, I just I just uh, think that that um, to to truly uh, to truly get at this, we we need to we need to think about uh, content policy reform in the same breath that we think about economic policy reform, and um, and 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 push for both in tandem. I'm always uh, conscious of a journalist asking another journalist a question about journalism, but but Nancy, the the fourth estate, particularly the in the current situation, where there are tens of thousands of journalists losing their jobs, yet the need for accurate information has been never been more prominent. Where does that go in terms of this conversation? Again, the page of the content question that uh, Define just mentioned. Where do you make the line between making sure that the fact checking, the journalism that provides the accurate information is out there, but then frankly, the way most 
news is consumed now is on platforms. So, so where do, does that need to be, that balance need to be redressed as well? I mean, I, sometimes I feel like we are in, a, in an extraordinary game of chicken. If you're watching what's happening in Australia, um, where their sort of competition watchdog proposed a code of conduct for Facebook and for Google that would basically require they would have to pay um, news organizations that they're linking to. And Facebook's response is, look, we could not include any of that content and it wouldn't, we wouldn't suffer at all. Like our profits would be fine. We don't, you need us more than we need you. And, uh, you know, which is kind of a remarkable thing because certainly, you know, when I was running a newsroom, our, the love hate relationship with the platforms that on the one hand were driving a huge amount of traffic and attention and particularly journalists want their work to get attention and these platforms that is you know their their extraordinary power is to direct attention but at the same time as you just said we're looking at an apocalypse when it comes to the the staffing of newsrooms and the economic underpinnings and that's because the platforms are taking basically two-thirds of every additional digital advertising dollar so uh you know i don't in terms of the 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 business model of the platforms, I do worry that uh, that news and reliable authoritative journalism is such a small part of their their content their that they could they could just say okay we 're going to get out of out of that business and and then to the extent you 're exactly right that this is where people go for news, would that make it even harder for people to know what is actually going on in their community, what is actually being proposed at local and federal and national levels, what's actually happening to the pandemic. Uh, so I, I think this is a very, very serious problem. I think it's why some of the debates about business models for journalism are assuming that a, a profitable, ad-driven, platform-dependent framework is not the way of the future because we've seen so we've seen the carnage that has resulted from this. No, most definitely. Um, I should also say thank you for everyone who's been asking questions over the last 40 minutes. I'm saving them up at the end, so it's not I'm, I'm not ignoring anyone. Um, I might turn that actually to back to Depayan quickly. We have a question here in terms of, should we say hierarchy of needs? If it came to, Nancy mentioned content, we have privacy and competition law. Uh, that maybe need to be reformed. If there was a one-two punch, what? How would you structure that? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I discuss in the book is that if you if you view this uh, this business model almost as a machine uh, that that prioritizes data collection, data analysis, uh, algorithmic design, um, and and holding rivals at bay through through corporate development uh, actions in, in the marketplace. If that's the machine, uh, and Facebook and Google essentially are machines. I mean, uh, they're, they're data servers. They're, they're physical infrastructures with data infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructures that, that uh, sit on top of those physical infrastructures. Um, uh, if, if you view it this way, and it's designed to maximize profit through, through engagement maximization uh, based on our personal interests, then it's, uh, in my view, it's inevitable that out of this black box, out of this machine that is uh, the social media company or the internet platform, uh, we will have negative externalities generated by that machine, like terrorist content, like, uh, like terrorist content that becomes engaging, like disinformation campaigns that become engaging and have an impact in our, in our media, have an impact on people and elections. So there's a machine that's generating negative externalities. And in my view, those negative externalities are here and now. You know, we, the, 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 the disinformation problem is a problem that we're gonna face in the next four months. And to truly, uh, truly diminish it and, and, and make sure that it's not a problem in, uh, in, in these four months, the only realistic thing that we can do is, is not focus on economic policy reform, but rather content policy reform. And, and uh, that would be in the form of Facebook setting up war rooms and uh, its oversight board uh, and potentially section 230 reform and, 
other kinds of things that you could do both uh, both immediately and over the next um, uh, couple of years, let's say, to better police the way that Facebook um, handles content issues. Um, so I see that as, as something that needs to happen, just as, as, as Nancy was suggesting earlier, and, and, and Robbie as well. I, I completely agree with that. Um, on, the, on the economic front, I see that as a big problem as well. And uh, unless you correct that problem, this content policy issue will continually happen because we'll never, never necessarily be able to agree on where the red line should, should lie in terms of what should constitute political content, what should constitute hate speech, et cetera, et cetera. Who should be considered a disinformation operator and, and whether that's a foreign or domestic question uh, only. So, uh, so to, I think on, we, we continually have to be thinking about content policy reform and forcing tech companies, uh, either through public sentiment or governmental regulation to uh, modernize the way that they, or keep modern the way that they uh, handle content for sure. But I would say that in, in the first instance on, on the economic front, what we need is strong privacy laws. Um, by, uh, when, when you look at data collection and, and uh, the use of data by companies like Google, uh, right now I would say that power, economic power is um, completely in the hands of the corporate and not at all in the hands of the consumer in the sense that we, we engage in a price inelastic situ uh, exchange where uh, essentially, we, um, as soon as we get access to the service, we're willing to give up any amount of currency um, that, that Google needs um, or wishes to have uh, to maintain our access to Gmail or, or Facebook or Instagram. And, and that currency, of course, is, it comes in the form of our data and our attention. Um, and uh, Google, companies like Google collect that data from everywhere. Uh, they collect that, that data through engagement on their platforms, through engagement on third-party websites, through our phones and, and our other, other ways of getting location data, through our transactions with our, through our credit agencies and credit cards, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to, to, I think the first step on this economic front is a sweeping and protective privacy law, similar to what uh, Europe has, even, even if, Mark, as you alluded to, it, it Europe hasn't enforced that law, the, the general data protection regulation, as well as it could. Um, and there, there are others on this call here. Uh, I mentioned David, David Edelman, and, and also Tom Wheeler and Phil Verveer, who've done a lot of work uh, to attempt to um, reform uh, data collection practices through a privacy law in the U.S. in the past. And, um, and I think I think that's that's the that's the first area that, that, that we have to start uh, start. That's the first area. It's not going to happen before November. So when when could that happen? Uh, that, that's a that's a very good question. Um, you know, I think I think um, political sentiment behind uh, privacy reform is is rising. Um, but again, we suffer from this privacy paradox where it's constantly going to be difficult for us to uh, to really force this down the throat of Congress because people don't essentially care. It's more of a social, uh, the, the harms from, from privacy are more social than individual. Um, I, think, I think over time, though, people are going to start to see this uh, more and more. Um, and uh, I think states are going to legislate on, on privacy as well because certain states are, are, have uh, specific powers that they can start to start to use to, to pass privacy laws and that'll force a conversation at the federal level as will um, foreign governments that, that pass their own privacy laws to, to try to, uh, to try to push back on the on the power of big tech and I think over time it'll it'll become in the country's interest the United States interest to, uh, to have a privacy law of its own and, and guide American companies in, in, the, in the direction that, that uh, the Congress wants uh, to guide them. 
We have a question here about the First Amendment and political ads. Uh, Robbie, I'm going to turn to you on this one. It talks about if the First Amendment, you know, could potentially protect these businesses because of the ability, you know, rightly under the Constitution to allow the First Amendment. But would the potential regulation of advertising also then for regulate speech? If I came to you in, say, early 2016 and said, I'm going to regulate the, the type of ads that you can put out for, for Hillary Clinton, would you not legitimately go, well, hang on, that's not how this should work? Where, where, is there a line you can draw between allowing freedom of speech and regulating the more politicized speech? Yeah, I think so. I, I actually don't know that the law, that, that there needs to be any change to our concept of political speech at all in this. I, the, the, look, if you own a broadcast television station today and a candidate for public office brings you a TV ad, you got to run it. You got to run it. Now, if an outside group comes, there, there, there are liabilities in place, but you run an ad from a candidate that is, that is political speech, it is protected by the courts, you got to run that thing. And I think the same should apply online. What I'm pushing back on is when you run an ad uh, with, a, with a TV station, uh, everybody sees it. <laughs> you actually have to file uh, that piece of content. You have, you, you know, people know exactly when it's running, they know exactly what it says, so on and so forth. Now, Facebook has purportedly put rules in place um, to do something similar. And I think that's a great step forward, but that's not regulated by anybody. You know, these, you talk to TV stations, they're, you know, they can lose their license if they don't follow these rules. So, so, so I think that's, I think that's one thing. Um, and, and then the, the other piece that we have to recognize is another very nebulous and complex challenge that the online space has brought up is, you know, people can set up these platforms, these social media platforms, and create a community online with absolutely no liability for what is said there. You think of 4chan or something like that, where the violence is actually spawned and perpetuated as a result of that platform. There is literally no, there's no liability, there's no recourse. So that's the piece that I'm pushing back on. And then the last thing I would say, again, with the TV ad is, I, you know who's, you know, it's everything's out there, you know, when it's running, you know, what stations it's on. With Facebook, I can see that an ad has been bought, but I don't know who saw it. And if it's misleading, how do you push back on that, right? Because you, you just have, and you have no idea how the, how the algorithm treats you versus someone else. And so that's, it, it's really that. It's not about regulating what's said. It's about holding people accountable for what their platforms perpetuate. But in the platform's defense, they have created, frankly, not the best, but some form of transparency around the political ad register. Twitter's taken the step of stopping some political ads, although they others still get through. Do you not give them some credit for, yeah, it's not perfect, and you don't know if the ad that you see is different than mine, but there is more transparency now than there was in, say, 2018. Oh, for sure. And, and 2016, certainly. And I, I, like I said, I think it is a step forward. I think the two things missing is, there is no consistency. So with broadcast communication, there is a government agency that has, you know, a, has a stick basically to make sure uh, that these platforms are following a clear set of rules that everybody understands. Because look, we have to trust that Facebook and Twitter are doing what they say, right? I mean, and, and you know, to use an example with, you know, the Cambridge Analytica thing, which I think has been overblown. But that's an example where people's data was supposed to not be stolen, <laughs> but it was, right? So there, I think there needs to be enforcement. And then second of all, this problem of once, it, once that ad that you can see goes into that algorithm, we have no idea who's seeing it. And so for a candidate who's running for office, it's very hard for them to be present in the debate with voters because they don't know who's seeing what. With the, the, the last 10 minutes, I'm just going to ask you all the same question and then we'll see how this goes. Um, there's so much stuff we've talked about, content regulation, privacy regulation, competition, the role of free speech, etc. But if there was one thing that you would like to see happen between now and November that could provide some good that would be, maybe not an easy win, but something that could help improve the current situation, what could that be and how would you go about doing that? 
Japan, I'm going to turn to you because you wrote a book on this. So uh, I gave the other two people a, a bit of time. So what would you change and how would you do it? You know, I think, I think part of your question is, uh, is, uh, has to do with what's realistic. Uh, what, what can we realistically accomplish in the next uh, four months that will have an uh, effect on, have a positive impact on, on um, November, uh, the circumstances around November, not necessarily the result, of course. Um, and I would, I would go to uh, kind of where Robbie uh, is going and, and suggest that, well, if we, if we want to protect uh, the, the situation, the, the, the political process, maybe the most important pillar of our, of our democracy, of president, presidential election and, and the process around that, um, then I think uh, given our uncertainty at a minimum, and, and perhaps even you could even say, given the negative externalities thrown off by micro-targeting, of political ads, micro-targeting of, of social content. Uh, and when I say micro-targeting, I don't just mean from the campaign side, from the Trump or Biden campaign, pushing ads at particular communities, but also Facebook or, or Google optimizing where those ads go based on their presumptions about us. I would, I would shut that feature off. And um, more, more broadly speaking, I would prefer a, a more, a fairer standard around um, how campaigns uh, are able to reach, um, uh, reach voters, especially in digital media contexts, um, because uh, there, there is so much arbitrage that's happening in the exchange of information, exchange of money um, through networks operated, designed by Facebook, where uh, while in, in the past we're, we were able to see clearly where our uh, advertising dollars go and, and the impact that we get from them. Uh, now, there, we have a situation where, uh, where uh, essentially a, a set of Russian disinformation operators can uh, try to identify the thin cracks in American society uh, and identify the thousand people in, in Manhattan and the 500 people in, in San Francisco and the, the 500 people in, in, in Houston that they believe will, uh, uh, for whom their, their divisive content will resonate the most. And they can just shower those thin cracks with society until those thin, thin cracks break. Uh, and I think that that's, that's among the biggest threats. The other one, of course, I think is that political campaigns themselves now have a free pass, at least on Facebook, to push, uh, uh, to push essentially political lies, um, disinformation. So I, I would say that the realistic thing that we can do in the next four months is, is raise the public sentiment and make a big public push for fairer standards around paid or even unpaid dissemination of political content uh, on major social media platforms, uh, whether that's through re governmental regulation or the, the voluntary moves that we've seen from, from Twitter and, and, and Google uh, and, and other smaller companies, not Facebook, uh, already. Um, I think, uh, I think either, either way, that is the biggest thing that we can do to protect, uh, protect our democracy um, as it concerns uh, digital media platforms uh, in the next few months. Thank you. And Nancy, I'm going to pass the magic wand to you now, and what would you like to see happen? Well, you know, I think it's so valuable to have books like Depayans that, that will just help all of us understand the dynamics that, you know, with these products that we interact with every day without understanding everything about how they work. And so um, I do agree that Robbie's point about transparency is essential. I, I think I wrote about five presidential campaigns and um, every each one was different and each one was you know incredibly fascinating in its own way but at least I always felt like I was watching the same and covering the same campaign that everyone else was watching and seeing and covering and Robbie's point that it's it's entirely possible that some of the most important things happening in this campaign are invisible to uh, to journalists, to to uh, the other campaign, to uh, any kind of regulator or uh, and to the public. 
is really problematic. So the, the anywhere where there can be the push for transparency so that you, you can know what people are seeing and who's paying for them to see it certainly seems like uh, an obvious starting point. I don't know if, if eliminating micro-targeting would, would do a lot of good or people on this call who know the pros and cons of some of these proposals much better than I, but I do think that, that so much of the most important dynamics are now invisible to us that it is impossible even to discuss interventions, even to talk about what kind of regulatory reform would make sense, uh, because we don't, we can't see the, the system that we, we can just see the damage downstream, but we can't see how the pollutants are flowing and to whom. And so I think that has to be the first step. We have to know what it is that we're looking at in order to know what it's going to take to fix it. On the transparency push, do you mean greater push from the platforms to show how the algorithms work? Or is it from the political campaigns to say, oh. I'm spending this money on this type of individual? How the algorithms work um, would obviously reveal so much, but in the, in specifically around the campaign is, you know, who is paying for what message to reach what audience, I think is the... And Robin? Yeah, I mean, I, I have so many ideas. I um, let, me, let me just throw out two quick things. One is I think longer term, uh, although it could happen quickly if we want, I do think we need, we, we need to think about what is news and what are we, what, what are we calling news and, and, and what should be allowed to be called news. Um, you know, you can't sell uh, aspirin, but, but, you know, package some placebo or snake oil or something. And um, I think people should be able to say whatever they want. It is a free country, but I do think we potentially with the prolifer proliferation of information, there could be a set of standards that people have to meet. Um, the same way, again, broadcast stations in this country have to meet standards when they are broadcasting news. So this isn't a new idea. And so I think exploring that in the online space so that labeling then is a real thing. If something can't call itself news, if it's not meeting a certain set of standards. That's one thing I think just, just for us to think about. But in that vein, you know, if we're thinking about this, again, this analogy between broadcast and these online platforms, I think it would be really interesting for the platforms to think about maybe having some free time for candidates where people have to watch content that the candidates have put up so that people who are living in their filter bubble are forced to hear from both sides. Um, the platforms could think about just shutting everything else down and just covering the conventions live the way broadcast television does, covering the debate lives the way broadcast television does. So I think there are some things that the platforms could do to serve the public right now. And if I, I agree that we can't change the world overnight, can't regulate overnight, but maybe there are some things they could do to send a clear signal. We realize we have an obligation to the public to use this huge, powerful platform we've built to help inform you better, not just cater to you. Uh, thanks, Sarah, Robbie. Uh, I'm conscious of time, but Department, I just want to come back to you now that Terms of Services, the services is uh, being released tomorrow. It's been a, a while in the works. What has most surprised you about this trip? What thing did you come to a conclusion at the end that you hadn't expected? Well, uh, thank you, Mark, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Nancy and Robbie, for, for, for joining for this conversation. Uh, you've been, all three of you have been brilliant, and um, I really appreciate everyone being here uh, and the support. Um, uh, I can't say that enough. Um, you know, this has been, uh, Mark, a two-year journey, and I think uh, uh, when I first talked to my publisher, Brookings and, and Bill is, uh, I think, on, on the call, uh, my editor, um, you know, it was, it was more a, uh, a story about my experience. And then I think what I started to understand as I, as I started to, uh, as I started to study the industry a little bit more and, and try to draw connections uh, here and there. Um, was that this isn't really this isn't really a, a story about um, uh, my experience. Um, it's it's there's a there's a much more important point to be made, uh, which is that uh, the media media ecosystem has has changed entirely. 
it is uh, fundamentally different. Um, and that is because, uh, in, in large part, because our technological base has, has evolved to a point where um, I think in some ways society is breaking. Um, and before it completely breaks, uh, there are certain things that we need to do. And uh, it, it's, it was a joy to, to take that journey. Um, and, and um, you know, I appreciate everyone who helped me uh, get there along the way. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for that. Uh, and I should say thank you to Nancy and Robbie also for joining us and to everyone who spent the hour with us. Thank you so much. I hope you really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. You were great, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.